Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do things. The Reverend Tim Hoy will now preach to us from God's word. You know, the few times that I preach, and I usually send out, my slides ahead of time so that everybody can be prepared and they're always surprised and I, maybe I shouldn't be surprised the songs that the worship team lead us kind of essentially cover the concept that I'm going to preach and in, in a musical enjoyable form so by the time I come to preach it's a little bit more pedantic you know maybe it's not worth it Maybe we just have the worship team come out and we sing those songs again and then it's the message. But I guess we can do that. So uh, today is the beginning of the church calendar, the Advent. Uh, it's, it's the beginning of the church year leading up to Christmas and go all the way around, I guess, to Thanksgiving. Uh, <clears throat> so as Pastor Wayne and the lay preachers we're discussing uh, what kind of uh, series should we use. I think that was it now. It's slide before that. No. Oh. Okay. And and so after some discussion, we came to this series on Isaiah chapter uh, Isaiah chapter. I have the control, so please, please, okay, let me advance it. And, the, and, the, and we chose the four names that was given to Jesus uh, in, the, in the book of Isaiah. Let me see if I can go back to the, uh, is this thing working? I guess. Okay. Thank you. So we come to this series, and we in I, in the passages read by our uh, read by Roseanne. Well, seriously, call me Reverend. We should call her Doctor Roseanne. So, just to be fair. But anyway, this, the, we we're going to do the series on these four names that was given to the coming Messiah. And I was tasked to do two things. I'm supposed to talk about the first one, the wonderful counselor, but I also tasked to give an introduction to this series. So the passage read was Isaiah uh, 9, 2 to 7, which in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7 to 12, is called the book of Emmanuel. It's about this person called Emmanuel. And I, in other words, Isaiah prophesied 600 years before Jesus came, uh, came to earth 
about his coming. And not only about his coming, but what he's coming to do. And so in this passage, we see six names, and we, so we should think about that. So let me lay the foundation what this four name is about. And we know Isaiah prophesied a lot about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, by the way, when I, I keep using the word Messiah because this, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish people use the word Messiah, and the New Testament is the word Christ. So it's interchangeable Messiah. When I say Messiah, if it's awkward to you, just think of it as Christ. And Isaiah prophesied about the coming of Messiah in, in this book of Emmanuel, chapter 7 to chapter, uh, chapter 12, in a number of places. But let's look at one of them. And this is in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we know the coming Messiah, his name is called Emmanuel. And, Eman and then in the passage that we just read for us, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of the peace, there shall be no end. And then this coming person will sit on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And this will actually accomplish, will actually happen because of God himself, the Lord of hosts, will do this. So there will be other references that will come to it as we, as we go over in this sermon. So as I said, Isaiah chapter 7 through 12 is called the book of Emmanuel. It's a prophecy given from God to Isaiah about the Messiah who is the embodiment of God is with his people. Sometimes when I did this, I was thinking about the word embodiment. It's probably not the best word, but there's a limitation in English language to convey uh, Hebrew thoughts. But the idea is that God, man cannot see God. And, and in Old Testament, you, for those who have read the Bible, go through Exodus and all that, the people said, we don't want to see God because if we see God, we will die. So man cannot see God. And, but when God took on flesh, when Jesus Christ came, that the incarnation, that's the passage that was read for us in John chapter 1. God in human form was walking among the people. So Emmanuel is the embodiment of God walking among his people. And this is true, and we know it referred to Jesus Christ because the angel told Joseph and Matthew recorded it for us so that we know Isaiah chapter 7, verse 12. This person, Emmanuel, is Jesus. When Jesus came, he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. So jo Joseph was met by the angel because Mary is pregnant with a child. And the angel said, Mary will bear a son, and Joseph must call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from sin. The word Jesus is the equivalent in Old Testament, Joshua, meaning God will save. So Jesus is going to be the savior of his people. And then the angel reminds Joseph, said, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said by the prophet Isaiah, behold, referring to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 12, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In fact, that Jesus is the Emmanuel that's promised in Isaiah chapter 7. Emmanuel means God with us. That is to say that at the birth of Jesus, God has come to his people. So, 
by reaching back to Isaiah, angel said to us and recorded for us in Matthew that Jesus is that Messiah. Christmas was foretold in the book of Isaiah 600 years before Jesus was born. So let's take some time to look at our passage in Isaiah chapter 9. And it says, God with us, because if you think of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 12, it says about the coming of this person named Emmanuel, it's a thesis statement. A thesis statement. Then Isaiah chapter 9 is the, the explanation, the development, right? So those of you who are in college, you write paper, that's how you do You have a thesis statement, you explain, explain how it works. How does God with us work? So let's look at this. And okay, this is going to be a little bit technical. I, 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 and a little bit of Hebrew vocabulary and grammar. So don't go to sleep on me, okay? Um, the, for unto us a child is born. In Hebrew, it reads, Ki Yalet Yula. Lanu. The last part of Lanu means to us. And you see that to us a son is given. Ben is the son, right? Benjamin is son of. So Natan means to give and then Lanu. So these are these few Hebrew words. What does that mean? Well, let's look at, first of all, the word for child is Yalet, meaning it's somebody who is born. And the, the next word is yulat. It's actually, it's a verb which meaning is born or is brought forth. So it's kind of redundant, right? Well, this is the thing that Hebrew languages, they have three consonants. And then they put those little dots underneath it. Those are vowels. And by different vowels, and they, you, you tell it's a noun, or it's a verb, and it's a participle. So, but the very fact that it says the child is born, that means a person who is to be born is born. So it's emphasis on the birth. But then there's the son was given. That means the son was not born. The son was already existing. It's like... Um, you know, Thanksgiving, I don't know how many, how many of you uh, have pumpkin pie. Some of you may say, okay, I make a pumpkin pie. So the pumpkin pie didn't exist. And under your gifted hands, the pumpkin pie was born. So it's like the child is born. But for me, I went to the store and bought one. It's already in existence. So the son is already in existence, but the child has to be born. So what does that mean? Well, in the, in the passage that was read for us at the, at the call of worship, John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the word became flesh, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. That is the born part because Jesus was not flesh until he was born. So a child was born. But then the rest of the verse says, and we beheld, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The son's already existed. He is just like the Father, full of grace and truth. So just by these two uh, phrases, two clauses in Hebrew, it actually tells us of both the humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ. So in this, just in these two phrases, a son is born, unto us a son is born, unto us a son, I mean a, a child is born and a son is given. It already 600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah already prophesied the coming Messiah is both human and God, both human and divine. 
It talks about both of the humanity of Jesus Christ and his divinity. So what is this child supposed to do? Well, it said this, for unto us child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means the child that is born, Jesus, the Messiah, is coming to rule. Is coming to rule. He's born to rule. And then the end of the passage is, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And, and on the throne of the David and his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time and forevermore. It tells us that his rule will be successful. In other words, Jesus is born to rule and his ruling will be successful. Now you notice the three dots there. That's the ellipsis. That's the part that we're going to look at later. It's, uh, Jesus is to be born Jesus to rule and his rule be successful. How can he be successful? That tells us that he is equipped. He's equipped to rule. So, so the four things, the four names that were given to him is to tell us that he's qualified, he's equipped to rule the kingdom of David and rule it well. So that is the context that we have this series of four sermons on the four names of Jesus Christ. So I was tasked to do two things. First is lay a foundation, so I've done that. Now we can focus on the four names. Right? So what is this child? What child is this? Well, this child is a wonderful counselor. It's a mighty God. His everlasting father is Prince of Peace. The characteristic or character and qualification of this child. And how do we, should we approach it? Well, not too far from here, there's a church called 10th Presbyterian Church. A long time ago, they have a pastor there named Dr. James Montgomery Boyce. And he said, I used to go, when I was a student at, at the college, I used to go to that church and sit under his ministry. And he said this, he said, it's worth, really worth to look at each one of these four things because they together describe the magnitude of the wonderful gift which God has given to us in Christ Jesus at Christmas. So what he's saying is that at Christmas time we should think about these four names because they help us appreciate the gift that God has given to us on Christmas. So what does this four name signify? Notice only the wonderful council is read. I'm only doing that one. I'm not going to do off because uh, Pe uh, Elder Perry Yan and John Chang and Pastor Wayne would deal with the other. So, But Dr. Boyce actually wrote a number of Christmas devotions over the years. And so one series he said, when he deal with these four, he said, God's wonderful gift. Jesus is God's wonderful gift to us. And then, a few years later, he wrote another one. He said, four gifts at Christmas. So is that one or is that four? Well, there's only one or is that four? Well, what he meant is that there's one person that's coming. That's Jesus. That God's gift is in Jesus. But this Jesus has four different aspects that he can impact to us in our living. So, having said all that, now let's go back to what I'm supposed to do, is look at what does wonderful counselor mean. Again, a little bit about Hebrew here. And those two words, the first one's Pele, that means wonderful, and the other one's Yoaz, meaning counselor. So the word counselor, Yoaz, actually comes from a verb. Now, you, just, pay, just look at those uh, figures for a little bit because you're going to see them again and again. That's the way the Hebrew language is out. And then they can use that so that we can understand what those two words mean. It means the counselor, meaning the root meaning from this word, as I said, the three 
three consonants. It means to give counsel or give advice. So when it's written as a participle form, that means it's a noun. It's the person who give advice. So it's a counsel. That's why it's translated in English, counselor. The word wonderful in Hebrew is Pele, not the guy who plays soccer, okay? Just, just sounds the same. Pele meaning it's, it's, it's a noun, but it functions. When two nouns put together, uh, it's called a noun cluster. The first one of them, it becomes the adjective des describing the other. And so what it really means, extraordinary and beyond understanding. So that's why we translate it Wonderful counselor. Now, so what does that mean to be a wonderful counselor? Well, we have to look at how Isaiah used these two words together. And actually, in the book of Isaiah, these two words are in close proximity a number of places. So it kind of helps us. And the best way to study the Bible is to let the Bible explain Bible. And God, in his wonderful wisdom, when he gave all these words to us, he also put in other places to help shed light on the places where we're looking. So, let's take a look. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 29, as you see those, I think you can see those two words, some of the part of it are, are close together. And this, is, this verse tells us that God, right, he said, this is from the Lord of hosts, that means God. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. In other words, the advice, the wonderful counsel gives us is just like God's advice. And in other words, the wonderful counselor is give us wonderful advice or counsel. Whatever it does, it's only because it's of divine nature. Because God's counsel is wonderful, and Jesus is God. And Jesus' counsel becomes wonderful. Right? One more, th one more place. Now, there's one more place. Remember at the beginning of chapter 9, verse 2, that was read to us. The, it says, the people in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And did you remember what our verse began with? I said... Nine six. What is the first word? Four, F O R four. And you remember, if you were paying attention when Pastor Wayne was preaching in the Roman series, he said, "When you see the word four, meaning because." So he said, "What is it there for?" Our verse tells us that the people who walk in darkness can see a great light. And people who are in deep darkness see all of a sudden a light shone upon them. How did it happen? How, why would these people sitting in darkness all of a sudden see great light? Somebody turned on the light. Because somebody turned on the light. But how is that light come? For because a child was born and the son is given. The coming of Jesus is turning on the light for the world. And in the, in the passage that, on the call to worship passage, actually said that. That Jesus, in Jesus was life and the life was light of man. The true light, that's Jesus Give light to everyone who was coming into the world. When Jesus Christ came to the world, the world was in darkness and he turned on the light because he is the light himself. And in fact, Jesus said that himself. 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but in the light of life. In other words, when Jesus Christ came, he is the light. He opens the eyes of the world. But that light is not just there. In fact, the light is to lead people to life. In other words, it will lead people to salvation because we know the gospel John talks about. Man is in sin, and then sin will lead to death, but when the life, but man will receive life when they come to Jesus. So what that means is that the wonderful counsel actually taking this, these verses together, what does, what does that mean? Light equal revelation. Jesus is the revealing God to us. John 1 says, we see the image of God. We see God himself, full of grace and truth. So the revelation, Jesus tells us what God is like. And when we accept the Christ into our life, it brings us life. When light comes into our life, into us, we have life. Life is salvation. So what's the wonderful counsel does? He provides salvation. Now, what else does the counselor uh, does? Th this is, again, I say chapter 7, or I say chapter 7 to 12, it's about the book of Emmanuel. It's continue to talk about Emmanuel, continue to talk about Jesus. And chapter 11 said this, and there shall come forth a shoot from stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom or understanding, the spirit of counsel or might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is about the human lineage of Jesus, of Emmanuel. It says, it's from the stump of Jesse, I'm sure you guys already gone to what gone through Samuel's and Kings already. So Jesse is David's father. That means Jesus is going to be a descendant of David. <coughs> he has to be a descendant of David. Only then he can sit on the throne of David, right? And the important this is that in chapter one of Matthew. It talks about the lineage of Jesus flowing specifically through David. That's important because he's coming to be a king, sitting on the king, kingdom of David. He has to be a descendant of David. But not only that, right? We know the human lineage of Jesus. But it tells us that this person, this Jesus, has the spirit of the Lord on him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding. So Jesus, the coming Messiah, will be full of wisdom and understanding. And by the way, in the book of Proverbs chapter 8, it talks the wisdom is speaking. Actually, wisdom, in that case, in Hebrew, I mean, Proverbs chapter 8, generally is understood as the second person of the Godhead. That's Jesus Christ was wisdom personified. And he was saying, the I wisdom, that's Jesus is talking. I dwell with prudence. I, have, I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord, again, the fear of the Lord is a hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of the evil and perverse speech I hate. I have counsel. In sound wisdom, I have insight, I have strength. The fear of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's the way to know God. So, but not only that, but it tells us that he has an understanding of how people should live, right? Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverse speech I hate. So in other words, it tells us the, the wonderful counselor who is coming, that is Jesus, is wisdom personified, and he's the person who is the source of all counsel and wisdom 
And what it does tell us is that he provides the solution to life's problem. So Jesus comes not just to give us salvation and then say, okay, you deal with it. His coming of Jesus is not just stop with Christmas and then that's it. And then we become Christian and then we are on our own. No, he actually provides wisdom which helps us to solve the life's, everyday life's problem. And let me show you this again in Isaiah. It says, uh, I said, O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful, again the word wonderful, and things, and plan. The word plan has come from the same root as the word counsel. And your counsel are form of all faithful and truth. So what kind of description of the counsel that this wonderful counsel give us is form of all. That means it's long standing and it stood the test of time. But it actually refers even further back, that way back to before the creation of time. That, that phrase, that how it does. And if you think about it, even before we were born, even before our parents were born, even before Adam was born, even before the world was created, God already had a solution for our life's problem. And then he says, it's faithful and true. Both those words come from the same root. We got aman or the... the our amen. And Jesus actually used that same phrase many times, 24 times. He said, Verily, verily, I said to you, or truly, truly, I said to you. Jesus is saying to us that everything he said is valid and true. So the wonderful counsel that gave us come to us not only to provide salvation, but provide solution for a life that is truthful and will be successful. So let me put all these two a bunch of things that you are floating in your head right now. Let's put it together. See what that means. So right? So why should I, why should I care about these four names? So why should I care about the, the Jesus' name uh, Wonderful Counselor? Uh, what does it have to do with me? It's doing with the Jews, right? It promised to the Jews. And we know that, right? The ch- he says, when, when the, for unto us a son is, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means Jesus is going to take on the responsibility of ruling the kingdom of David. And the David, it will be successful because he's going to have it peaceful, and justice and righteousness and forevermore. Has it happened? The Jews, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came, and after 33 years later, Jesus was crucified. They were still under the thumbs of the Romans. Nothing didn't happen. And, but Apostle Paul tells us in Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians said, and then there'll be end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, and destroying every rule and every authority. Apostle Paul tells us that it will happen, but it will happen at the end. At the end. So if you think about it, between Isaiah 9, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, there's a time gap. And it went on for 2,000 years. That time gap still going on. Why is that? Did God fail in his promise? Well, to get the answer, we actually have to go way back to Isaiah. You know, Isaiah gave us all these wonderful promises and all that stuff. It hadn't happened except for the birth of Jesus, but nothing else happened. Well, we kind of have to go back to the beginning of Isaiah's ministry when he first got the job. Right? Isaiah chapter 6. And remember, Isaiah saw God holy and lifted up, and, and then 
You know, he said, I'm a sinful man. God, the angel put the uh, coal and cleaned his lips. So then God said, uh, who can we send? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I, Isaiah raised his hand to hear my Lord send me. And then God says, okay, go. And say to the people, keep hearing but do not understand. Keep seeing but do not perceive. What Isaiah is given a message that you can go preach this message, but nobody will pay attention. He's going to fail in his ministry. Who's going to do a job? <laughs> if somebody tell you that, okay, I'll give you a job, but you will fail in its job. But that's Isaiah's job. Right? And in the passage that we read for our uh, call to worship, John chapter 1, verse 11, Jesus, he, that's the word Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Did not receive him. Even Jesus at one time in Matthew 11 says, he acknowledged that the people are not going to receive him. He says, I, th- he, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hidden these things. So there was a time that Jesus came, and then there's a scam that people will not receive the message. For what purpose? Well, Apostle Paul tells us that. In Romans, in the series of Romans, we just finished. And it's worth your while if you haven't done that, go back and listen to those messages. In Romans 11, he said, Now I'm speaking to you Gentile, inasmuch that I, as I am an apostle with Gentile, I magnify the mystery. He go talk about why the Jews people rejected Jesus. And he said, because when the Jews rejected Jesus, it means the reconciliation of the world. In other words, for the period of time before the Jews will ultimately accept Jesus, God opened the door for Gentiles. The coming of Jesus, if it immediately be successful, will be left out because it was for the Jews. We'll have no chance. But God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, kept this thing open for a while so that you, so that me, so that you and I, we can participate in the ultimate reconciliation of the world by Jesus. So therefore the son or the child that was to be born, the son that was given, will become the wonderful counselor to the Jews Isaiah. That time that was promised to them is also the wonderful counselor for you and me today. You, the gift of Christmas is Jesus. That one aspect of it, the wonderful counselor, is also for me and also for you, for us. The gift of Jesus is in our life today. So when we celebrate Christmas, it's not a historical event. It's still practical for us. So the gift of this wonderful counselor has meaning not just to the Jews who are anticipating, but it is to us. It's important to us. It's also to us. So let's think about what is it to you and to me? Remember we said the wonderful counselor means two things, that he brings us salvation and then he provides solution to our life problem. So let's look in the reverse order. Right? We've seen this before. That Jesus, the wonderful counselor, provides so- solution to our problems in life. So how does it do that? Well, I thought about it I, and look at the scripture over and over again. And then it dawned on me. You know, let me that we are studying the book of Hebrews in the second 
hours. Let me put a plug into it for you. If you haven't started coming, you should start coming because it's, the, the class is led by uh, Warden and uh, Perry. It's very helpful. Actually, in fact, it tells us about uh, <clears throat> what Jesus does. In Hebrew chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, tells us, well, first of all, the book of Hebrews is about Jesus is, is, is superior to angels, Moses, Aaron, etc., etc. But in this passage, if you look at it, it says, since then we have a great high priest. It's talking about Jesus being the priest in the order of Melchizedek. If you don't know what that means, come to second hour. Uh, since then, we have a great high priest, that Jesus is the high priest who went to heaven, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold our, for fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us stand with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find grace in the time of hell. It tells us that the human high priest in the Old Testament time, they are unable to sympathize with our struggle with life. But Jesus is able because he's tempted. He, he has gone through the difficulty of life, but never succumbed to it. So he knows how hard it is. There's no problem that we have gone through or tempted that to a degree that he has. To a degree that he has. So if you think that, if I think that my problem is so hard, Jesus have experienced that even more, and yet without sin. But having experienced that, he can sympathize with us, with our struggle in life. And he says he's ready to help. He's ready to help. Jesus himself said in Matthew uh, 11, 28, he said, Come to me, come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Most of our struggle is not just physical, sometimes emotional, spiritual. And you come to Jesus, Jesus will give you rest. In other words, we will trust him, you'll find peace and rest. No problem that we face, that he hasn't faced, and he has a solution. Now, it doesn't always happen right away. It doesn't happen right away. Uh, I gave you my personal experience. Um, I have to be careful. I don't want to say that my kids are bad. I was bad. I was a rebellious kid. And some, one or more of my kids inherited that part from me. And during their teen years, I was struggling. And for the longest time, you know how Chinese parents think, right, spare the rod, spoil the child? That doesn't work. And then, you know, then the, the new way, or you bribe them, you buy them things, that didn't work. Until I realized that, I had, that the child, the, the children are the gift from the Lord, and I need to return to the Lord then he'll resolve it. And the problem was resolved, but took time. And for those years, many years, quite a few years, you know, I struggled and I cried. I didn't want to cry in front of Helen. So between home and work, those about 15 minutes drive, I cried before the Lord. And you know what? The solution came ultimately, but in God's timing. No matter how hard the life's a problem that you are facing, Jesus is ready to provide need. And he says, find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus doesn't come to us as, you're so stupid, why don't you do it this way? I'm not a good teacher, so that's, I'm impatient. Sometimes I tend to tell people, why don't you just look at it this way? When Jesus provides help, it's in the form of grace. So, in Christmas time, we know Jesus is a wonderful counselor because he provides grace. Now, the, the other part is that the wonderful counselor, obviously the most important part that we can 
Jesus came to provide salvation. And again, the book, book of Hebrews tells us that. We haven't gone to, to come to this passage yet. It's a little hard to read. It's a small. But let me read to you. In chapter 10, consequently, when Christ came into the world, Jesus Christ said, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. A body you prepare for me. That is the incarnation. That's John 1. The word became flesh. But he took on the human flesh for ultimate purpose. He says, Then Christ said, Behold, I have come to do your will. O God, it is written for of me in the scroll. We have been we have been sacrificed through the offering, or been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. The Jesus' body was prepared so that he can sacrifice that body. When he came, God already said, you will be sacrificed. Your body is to be sacrificed. In other words, incarnation, Christmas, always point to crucifixion. Christmas always point to Easter. So when the sacrifice of Jesus took place, we became sanctified. So we are sanctified. We become holy, acceptable to God. We are holy and righteous, sanctified. You know, it's appropriate that today is the first Sunday that we also celebrate the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the commemoration of that body that God prepared so that it can be sacrificed for us. So, as we go to communion, Lord's Supper, let's take time to remember at this Christmas time, at this Advent time, Jesus came equipped as a wonderful counselor for you, for me. Let's pray.